Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Well, Shabbat Shalom. We're continuing our uh, marathon series as we slowly uh, crawl verse by verse through the, through the entire uh, Gospel of Mark. If I'm counting correctly, today's part 37. If you've missed any of the first 36 parts, they're all up on our YouTube channel and on our website, uh, ecdallas.org. We're going to look today at, at the soldiers uh, and the crowd and the religious leaders uh, and everybody all mocking Yeshua as he scourged, as he's crucified. So turn with me to Mark 15, beginning in verse 16. Mark 15, verse 16. Let me have it on the overhead. The soldiers led Yeshua away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers, about 600 of them in a company. Uh, and they put a purple robe on him, twisted together a crown of thorns, and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head uh, with a staff and spit on him. Thong on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, were, were passing by on his way in from the country. And they forced him, Simon, uh, to carry the cross. They brought Yeshua to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each one would get. It was 9 a.m. when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. We're going to look at that in much more detail next week, by the way. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the Torah teachers mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. We see a theme running through this whole passage that Yeshua He's mocked, insulted, jeered at, laughed at, uh, humiliated, and shamed. In verse 16 to 20, we see the soldiers uh, mock him and make fun of him, spitting on him, uh, jeering at him. They put this purple robe on him and a crown of thorns, and then they give him a staff. Uh, this royal robe and the crown of thorns and the scepter, these were all satanic mockeries of the true messianic coronation. Uh, the crown of thorns, of course, alludes back to the curse on the ground. We read in Genesis 3.18, thorns and thistles, uh, it shall grow for you from the curse. And then in verse 24, he stripped of his clothes, stripping him of his dignity uh, and shaming him. Verse 26, we have this ironic mocking statement, king of the Jews. Verses 29 and 30, the pastor buys, insult him. Verse 31, 32, the religious leaders mock and insult him. And then finally, at the very end, even the two thieves crucified with him heap insults upon him. Mark wants, to, wants us to see that on the cross, Yeshua was not only tortured and killed, but he was also shamed and humiliated. And we learn three things here from this account on the overhead. Number one, the mocking tells us about our own hearts. Number two, the mocking reveals Yeshua's Heart. And then finally, number three, if we let it, the mocking can change our hearts so that they are more like his. So first, how does this mocking uh, show us our own hearts uh, in two ways on the overhead? Uh, it reveals, first, it, re it reveals our absolute hostility to his claims. We hate the claims of Yeshua. What are they making fun of him for? Uh, are they mocking him because of the Sermon on the Mount? Are they mocking him for being a, a wise teacher? No. They're making fun of him for his incredibly huge claims. 
that he's the king of the Jews, uh, that he's the savior of the Mashiach, uh, that he's the ultimate temple by, by which we can enter God's presence. Uh, they mock, they say, you're the ultimate temple the way we get to God? These are incredible claims, and that's what they hate. Uh, and that's why they're mocking and deriding at the overhead. And the magnitude of those claims brings out in all of our hearts a hostility. We can't stand the size of those claims. Here's a contemporary example of this phenomenon. Uh, famous author Anne Rice, uh, who for most of her life was a secular person, toward the end of her life, she actually be became a believer. And she was doing research to write this, this novel uh, about the life of Yeshua, uh, doing lots of historical research. And for the last hundred years, there's been a lot of secular, liberal, historical scholarship uh, trying to, to so-called get behind uh, the Gospels from a, a critical studies standpoint. We see this, for example, in the Da Vinci Code, uh, in the Jesus Tomb, uh, the popularity of the Gnostic Gospels, the so-called Jesus Project. These liberal scholars, they say, we have to get behind the Gospels to get the real historical Yeshua. And they say the real histor historical Yeshua, well, he never really made any of these outrageous claims. He never really claimed to be the Messiah and the King and the Savior and the Son of God. He was just a teacher of righteousness. So Anne Rice, uh, she began to study this, this historical scholarship. And what she found stunned her. Here's what she says in her book, uh, Out of Egypt, uh, on the overhead. She says, the skeptical arguments which insisted uh, the Gospels are suspect or are allegedly written too late to be eyewitnesses, all these arguments lack coherence and are full of conjecture. Some of the books I read were no more than assumptions piled on assumptions. Absurd conclusions are reached based on little or no data at all. The whole case for, for the non-divine Yeshua who stumbled into Jerusalem and somehow got crucified and had nothing to do with the founding of Christianity, which allegedly came much later, that whole picture which floated in the liberal circle I frequented for 30 years, that case was never made. But not only was that case not made, but I found something even more surprising. I discovered that these scholars who devoted their lives to New Testament scholarship disliked Yeshua. Some pitied him as a helpless failure. Others sneered at him. Some showed outright contempt. Now, I've never come across this in any other field of research. For example, people who go into Elizabethan studies are not allowed to prove that Queen Elizabeth was an idiot. People in Elizabethan studies don't make snickering remarks about her or spend their careers trying to pick apart her historical reputation. Occasionally, scholars will study a villain in history, but even then, they tend to argue for the importance of his or her place in history. Scholars don't spend their lives in the company of historical figures whom they openly despise. But these New Testament scholars detest and despise Yeshua. What stunned her was why there'd be this whole area of scholarship, the only area of historical scholarship she had ever seen, where so many scholars were mocking Yeshua uh, and despising him and sneering at him. Why would they do that? And the answer is in our text today. The claims that Yeshua made, we hate. And we'll do everything we possibly can to undermine them or get rid of them. That's the reason we have things like the Da Vinci Code and the Gnostic Gospels and the, and the Jesus Project. They're an expression of this contempt we can't stand these claims on the overhead. You know why? Because they force us into an all or nothing decision. And we hate that. If Yeshua had merely said, I'm a teacher pointing the way to God, uh, then we could say, well, maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Maybe part of it's true, maybe part of it's not true. But when Yeshua says, I'm the unique one and only son of God, I'm the savior of the world. No man comes to the father but through me. I'm the king. Then it's all or nothing on the overhead. So you can't like him. You have to either completely adore him 
or despise him. And we don't want that. We want to keep our options open. Flannery O'Connor wrote a short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find. Uh, and in the story, there's a psychopathic criminal called uh, the Misfit who's talking to a grandmother whom he had apprehended uh, along with her whole family uh, to rob them. And he's killing the whole family one at a time. And the grandmother, she's pleading for her life. And the misfit and the grandmother had this dialogue. Uh, and the grandmother, she's very religious, and she says to the misfit, oh, you need to pray more. Oh, you need to read your Bible more. Uh, and I'm sure deep down, you're really a good boy. And she says, you need to pray to Jesus on the overhead. And here's what he says. Jesus? Jesus threw everything off balance. If he did what he said, then there's nothing for you to do but to throw away everything and follow him. But if he didn't, then there's nothing to do but enjoy the few minutes you've got left the best way you can by killing someone or burning down their house or, or, or doing some kind of meanness to him. No pleasure like meanness. He says Yeshua threw everything off balance. And then later on, Flannery O'Connor, the author, uh, she wrote this about the story. I'm going to put this on the overhead, her own commentary. She said, the story is a duel of sorts between the grandmother with her superficial beliefs and the misfits' more profoundly felt involvement with Yeshua's action, which set the whole world off balance for him. The grandmother is so, is so much like a lot of us. She's just religious. She's just nice. But the misfit, he actually knows it's all or nothing. The world's been thrown off balance. You cannot stay on the fence. Yeshua threw everything off balance. And that's what we deep down in our hearts can't stand. We don't want to have to either despise him or totally worship him. We want to just pick and choose what we like and what we don't like from his teaching on the overhead. But no, Yeshua throws everything off balance, and we hate that. And the hostility hiding in our hearts is drawn out by the magnitude of his claims and the exclusiveness of his claims. Here's an example of the sin in our hearts. In his autobiography, the famous autobiography, The Confessions by Augustine, he's trying to figure out why as a little boy he broke into this pear orchard and stole pears when he says, A, I wasn't hungry, B, I don't even like pears. <laughs> and he realized the reason he did it was because someone told him he couldn't. He says, I would not have had any interest in the pears except that they were forbidden. And he realized that at the core of his heart, and the core of all of our hearts, there's something that says, nobody tells me what to do. There's something in our hearts, to quote a famous poem, that says, I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. I'm the overhead. And when Yeshua comes near us, this rebellious spirit comes out. The mockery shows us that we are hostile. We can't stand the magnitude and the exclusiveness of his claims. We can't stand the all or nothing decision that Yeshua's claims demand. Now, if you're just religious, like, like, like the grandmother in that story, if you say, I don't despise him, I don't mock him, I don't hate him, but I also don't tr totally and completely center my life on him, if it's not one or the other, then either you have no integrity or you don't know who he is and what he says. Listen to him. Listen to him and see him begin to work on your heart. On the overhead. It's all or nothing. So the mockery, number one, the mockery shows us our hostility to the magnitude of Yeshua's claims. And now number two, it also shows us our blindness to the, quote, quote, weakness of his ways on the overhead. Yeshua, paradoxically, he's magnificent in the magnitude of his claims, but at the same time, he's weak in his ways. He comes humbly. 
He comes without a horse, uh, without an army, without the usual trappings of power. He comes in weakness. So, so the second thread coming through the mockery is they're saying, you couldn't be the king. You couldn't be the savior. You're too weak. Uh, if, if, if you were the king, I couldn't do this and this and this to you, which I'm doing. If God was really with you, you'd be strong. He'd be protecting you. He wouldn't let us be beating you and spitting on you and flogging you and mocking you and crucifying you and killing you. You couldn't be the savior. You couldn't be the king. Because God wouldn't work through such weakness and vulnerability and suffering and pain. The mockery shows us that we can't stand when anything weak comes into our life. Or when suffering comes into our life. And when it does, we tend to get very hard. We tend to mock. When blow after blow comes into your life... When disappointment after disappointment comes into your life, you will often get hard and cynical and mocking and bitter. You start to mock the whole idea of the love of God. Hey, loving God, you say? Right. Ha. What a joke. I don't think I, don't, I, don't think I could survive much more of that love. <laughs> what are you doing? You're mocking. You're getting hard. You're starting to despise And do you know why? Because you're starting to get an air of superiority. Mocking always requires superiority and pride. And the only way you can get hard uh, and angry and cynical towards God uh, when bad things are happening to you is if you think you know better than he does how your life ought to go. You know exactly what should be happening and God's not getting it right. So you think you know what's best. You can see the end from the beginning, right? But do you know what the mockery is showing us? It's showing us that God does work like this. If you insist that God can't be working in your life in difficulty, he can't be working in your life through weakness, he can't be present with you, or he wouldn't let all these bad things happen to you, if that's your attitude, you're going to miss the biggest things that God is doing in your life. (laughs) Because you know what the real irony is here? The crowds mocking Yeshua are being ironic. They're saying, oh, you're the king. You know, you say you're the the savior. They're being ironic. But here, the ironic is ironic. (laughs) They're saying, God couldn't be saving the world through, through, through somebody like you, Yeshua. God couldn't be saving the world through weakness. God could not be saving the world through the cross. But he was. God was. These people were looking at the greatest thing God has ever done in the history of the universe. And it wouldn't fit into their little categories. So they rejected it. It burst all their paradigms for who the Messiah would be and what he would do. And so they missed it. And I'm worried for some of you. Because you may be looking at some pretty bad things happening in your life. George was talking to us about all the bad things that may be coming down in these birth pains. And you're saying the same thing. You're saying, how could God be in this? How could God let bad things happen to me? How can it be God's will to work through weakness and difficulty? If God was with me, he wouldn't let these things happen. God couldn't be working through those things like this. My holy brothers and sisters of Etz Chaim, do not make this mistake. Do not be a mocker. Do not assume that God cannot work through tragedy or disappointment or failure or even betrayal on the overhead. So the mocking of Yeshua shows, number one, it shows our hostility to the greatness of his claims. And and number two, our blindness to the weakness of his ways. So that's point number one. What's in our hearts? It's pretty revealing and sobering. And now on the overhead, point number two. The mockery not only shows us our heart, 
but chose us Yeshua's heart, his heart. Yeshua, in taking on all this extreme shame and humiliation, shows us what he is about. In Mark 15, verse 31, we read, in the same way the chief priests and the Torah teachers mocked him, saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the so-called King of Israel, come down from the cross. Then we'll see and believe. Now, you think that these chief priests and Torah teachers must have been through a lot of blockbuster movies. <laughs> because all, in all the big action-adventure movies, it always gets worse and worse and worse, right? And this is the spot where the hero looks like a goner. He's about to die. This is it. But in all the blockbuster movies, or at least all those who make any money, at this final point in the movie, at the big climax, the hero turns the tables. There's this dramatic reversal or a rescue. He comes down off the cross. He finds a chink in the enemy's armor. Uh, he finds a weakness in their defense. He turns the tables. He escapes from prison. Uh, he defeats the villain. And the movie ends and justice is vindicated and everyone lives happily ever after. And everyone's looking at Yeshua. They say, we understand. You say you're the hero of the story. And this is where the hero does his thing. If you're really the savior, if God is really with you, come down off the cross. This is the time. We're waiting. But here's the problem. They don't realize how great he really is. This is the almighty creator of the universe. And they're saying, if you're the hero, prove it. Come down off the cross on the overhead. But here's what they don't get. He's so infinitely great that he expressed his heroism and his greatness by not coming down off the cross. Because in the greatest act of self-control in the history of the universe, the all-powerful God became weak and stayed weak under the most dire circumstances. And he chose to stay on the cross. He didn't flinch. He took it. And he bore the wrath of God for your sake and mine. Out of infinite love. He was being humiliated and shamed and mocked and tortured. And he took it all for you. For me. Now remember, this was a traditional shame and honor culture. And in a shame and honor culture, your name... Your, your reputation was the most important thing. In fact, uh, in, the, in, the, in the psyche of the ancient cultures, having a good name was the main way in which you lived on. It was everything. And so for your name to be turned into a laughing stock, <laughs> to have your name turned into a byword, was essentially seen as the equivalent of going to hell. To have your name destroyed was the ultimate punishment. And that's why the crucifixion was the worst of all executions. Because it wasn't just killing your body, it was killing your name. You were stripped naked, uh, people gawked and stared uh, and mocked. Uh, all dignity was taken from you. You were a laughing stock. On the cross, Yeshua was not just being killed. He was being shamed. He was having his name destroyed. And he took it. Why? Here's why. I'm going to explain why by giving you a synopsis of one of my all-time personal favorite movies. Made way back in 1938 called The Angels with Dirty Faces, starring Jimmy Cagney and Patrick O'Brien. And in the movie, there are these two young kids who grew up together in a bad part of New York City called Hell's Kitchen. It was basically the slums. Jimmy Cagney grows up to be Rocky Sullivan, a notorious gangster. Uh, he's larger than life, uh, this braggart, uh, he's snarling, uh, very violent, uh, a celebrity gangster. Uh, and he kills anyone who dares cross him. And all the young kids in the slums, they look up to him as some kind of hero, some kind of role model. Patrick O'Brien, the other star, he goes up to become Father uh, Jerry Connolly, uh, a priest. Uh, and he works in the slums, trying to save kids from a life of crime. He works with all these same kids who idolize Rocky Sullivan. Uh, and these kids who are going in a bad direction. Uh, and they're going into crime. And they're dropping out of school. 
And they're all looking up to Rocky, uh, this anti-hero. Eventually, Rocky's caught by the police. He's tried and found guilty of murder, sentenced to die in the electric chair. And the night before he's going to be executed, Father Jerry comes to see his old boyhood friend, Rocky. And Father Jerry says, Rocky, I've got a favor to ask you. And here's the dialogue. We'll put it on the overhead. Father Jerry, on the next slide. Uh, next slide. Can you go to the next slide for uh, the dialogue? Okay, there we go. Thank you. Father Jerry says, Rocky, suppose I ask you tomorrow to be scared. Suppose at the last minute, the guards drag you out of here, screaming for mercy. Suppose you went to the chair yellow, a coward. Rocky, what? Me die yellow? What's the matter with you, Jerry? Father Jerry, I want you to have courage, but a different kind of courage. The kind that's born in heaven. Not your swagger and bravado. I want the kind of courage that only you and I and God will ever know about. I want you to let the, those boys in my neighborhood down. You've been a hero to these kids and, and, and hundreds like them. Uh, and now you're going to be a glorified hero in your death. And I want to prevent that. They've got to despise your memory. That's their only hope. They've got to be ashamed of you. You're asking me to pull an act? To turn yellow? So these kids will think I'm no good? You ask me to throw away the only thing I have left? You ask me to crawl on my belly? Nothing doing. You're asking too much. Now, why is Father Jerry asking this of Rocky? Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, Rocky, it's them or you. If you go out in glory, they go down into a life of shame. But if you're willing to go down into a life of shame, if you're willing to throw away the rest of your life, throw away your reputation, and go out in horrible humiliation and shame, they can be saved. Will you do that for them, Rocky? And what does Rocky say? No, no, that's all I got left. Are you kidding? So the next morning, at dawn, it's the execution. And Father Jerry, the priest, uh, comes along with the guards, and they bring Rocky out of his cell. And he comes out with a snarl, as only Jimmy Cagney can snarl. And he's walking down the corridor, and, and he slugs one of the prison guards. He's showing everyone, I'm going out the same way I came in. That's what it looks like. But when he gets to the door of the death chamber, suddenly... He begins to squeal like a child. And he begins to cry and wail and snivel and shouts out, No, 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 I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Please don't burn me. And he turns into this sniveling coward, completely melts down. And they grab him and they strap him into the electric chair. And he's crying out and he's screaming the whole time until they finally pull the switch. And Father Jerry looks to heaven and prays a prayer of thanks. And all the kids in Hell's Kitchen read the, 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 the accounts in the newspaper of Rocky going out like a coward. And they no longer look up to him. And they start to turn their lives around. A brilliant, inspiring movie. I'm not in this story, but just watching it makes me want to be a better person. But guess what? The gospel says, you and I are in the story. We're those boys. We're those boys. We're those at-risk kids whose whole lives are about to go down the toilet. In the movie, it's Rocky or those kids that will suffer on the overhead. But in real life, it's Yeshua or us. If he holds on to his glory... We go down into eternal shame. But if Yeshua goes down in eternal shame, we can live in glory. Psalm 2 depicts how the human race thinks it knows how to run the world. And the nations rage and they try to throw off the, the bonds of God. Psalm 2 verse 2 says, The kings of the earth rise up and the, kings, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his Messiah. 
saying, let's break their chains. Let's throw off their, their shackles. But it's a laughable thing. Verse 4, Psalm 2, verse 4. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. It's just risible, you know, laughable. That we humans think we can run things. It's laughable that we think we don't need God. And there's this famous uh, recitative uh, in Handel's Messiah, based on Psalm 2, and we have it on the overhead here, that says, He shall laugh them to scorn. He shall have them in derision. We deserve shame. We deserve to be laughed at. We deserve to be mocked. But Yeshua is the suffering servant. And Isaiah 53 tells us that when the servant of the Lord, the Messiah comes, in verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. And then it says in Isaiah 50, verse 6, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pluck out my beard. I did not hide my face from what? From the mocking and the spitting. What an amazing prophecy. Yeshua wasn't just killed, he was shamed. Why? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him sin who knew no sin that we may become the righteousness of God in him. On the overhead, Yeshua took the shame. He had his reputation destroyed. He had his name destroyed so that we could live and have a name with God forever. Uh, Revelation chapter 2 says, everyone who, who trusts in Yeshua will receive a, a little white stone uh, and on it a, a, a name written, a secret name. It doesn't matter what anyone says about you. That stone tangibly reminds you that the only one who counts, the Lord God himself, loves you. If you're in Yeshua, you have the applause of God, the accolades of God. Yeshua took the shame we deserve so that we could have the glory with God forever. You need to see Yeshua not only died for you, he was also shamed for you. And in return, he gives you his life and his glory. So on the overhead, number one, you need to see your own heart. Number two, see Yeshua's heart. And now finally, number three, if you let it, the mockery can help your heart become like Yeshua's heart. How? Well, first of all, we don't know how to deal with suffering. When suffering comes into our life, it tends to make us hard. It tends to make us into a mocking person, Uh, you know, a loving God. Yeah, sure. But Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, says this on the overhead. In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And the overhead, the thorn. How did Paul keep his sufferings from making him hard? Why was he able to be patient and courageous, even joyful, in the midst of his suffering? Why was it that sufferings uh, made him softer, made him tender to other people? Because he remembered Yeshua's thorn. He remembered the ultimate thorns, the crown of thorns. He remembered, just as he said, uh, Lord, please take this thorn. Just as Paul said, Lord, please just take this thorn away. In the same way in the garden, Yeshua asked the Father, please take this cup from me. And like the Lord said to Paul, he also said to Yeshua, my power is made perfect in weakness. On the overhead. What the Father was saying to Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane is only through your weakness can my power be released into the world. My resurrection power through your weakness. And now Paul says, if Yeshua could suffer that ultimate suffering uncomplainingly for me, then I can suffer for him. If Yeshua's suffering released power into the world, 
in his weakness, if his weakness released power into the world, then Paul says, I know that if I receive my weakness in patience and gratitude, somehow that will help release God's grace into, into my life and into the life of others around me. And so Paul, remembering the weakness Yeshua went through, changes his heart. So now when weakness comes to him, he can embrace it without it breaking him or making him hard or mocking. And here's the second and final thing. How do you deal with people reviling you, slandering you, verbally attacking you, tearing down your reputation? Our society, of course, says to protest. Take to the streets, or at least social media, take to social media. How dare you dishonor me? I remember hearing about a believer who had been unfairly vilified by people whom he thought were his friends. And it ruined his reputation. And he was struggling with bitterness. Uh, he was turning into a mocker, turning into a hard, bitter person. Until during his daily devotionals, he came across Philippians 2, verse 7, where it says of Yeshua, but he made himself of no reputation. Yeshua made himself of no reputation. He lost the ultimate name so that you could have a name with God forever. And after meditating on that verse, his bitterness broke. People will sometimes misunderstand you, sometimes even willfully. Now, a believer knows the gospel says we're saved by grace, not works. Uh, but a non-believer typically says, well, well, if there is a God, you get to him simply by being a good person. So when a non-believer hears a believer say, I have a personal relationship with God, they immediately assume that you must think you're awfully good. You must think you're better than everybody else. And you say, no, 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 you don't understand the gospel. Well, of course they don't. They're not a believer. You can't expect them to understand. Look, Yeshua saved you by taking insults and not paying them back. Yeshua saved you by being shamed. Yeshua saved you by being misunderstood. Hebrews 12, verse 2 for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. So now when you're misunderstood, you share in his disgrace. And it's part of your witness. And because you have a non-believer, and because you, you now love non-believers, and you want to minister to non-believers, they're going to misunderstand your motives. So what? Let them. Don't be so easily offended. Because you now walk in the footsteps of the one who, when he was reviled, reviled not back. Because when you get that white stone, a name with God that no one can take away, Yeshua was shamed so that you could have the glory of God. So who cares what other people think about you or say about you? Let the mocking of Yeshua turn you into someone who can handle weakness, uh, who can handle being misunderstood. And let it turn you more and more into his image. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Hallelujah. I'd like to ask Bart Rifter to come up. Father, thank you. Thank you for this teaching on us, uh, on the mockery of Messiah. Because it reveals our own hearts. Deep down, we're hostile to the magnitude of your claims, Yeshua. Because it forces us into this all or nothing decision. We can't sit on the fence. We either must bow down to you, Yeshua, and adore you and worship you and give our whole lives to you, or utterly reject you and have nothing to do with you. These are the only choices with any integrity. We can't just like you, Yeshua. You don't leave us that option. Yeshua, you have set everything off balance. <laughs> so Lord Yeshua, we choose today to worship you. We choose to serve you with our whole heart, wholly devote our li entire lives to you. Help us not to be thrown off by your seeming weakness in submitting to the mockery and the spitting and the beating and the torture and the death. Because it's only by your submitting to the shame that we can live in glory. It's only through your weakness that we can be strong. It's only by you losing your reputation that we can have a name with God. And your strength is sufficient for us. Your power is made perfect in weakness. So when we face trials and difficulties and setbacks and disappointments and suffering, help us to see that in you, we can be strong. 
that our identity and acceptance and accolades and vindication is with you and in you, Yeshua. And not in man, not in the world, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And we pray this all in your name. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.